Amen. I believe this is night number six. Have mercy. All right. We have had some wonderful meetings and we're going to continue on in Jesus name. And of course, um, if you have any prayer requests, you can write them on the back of the card. And did we have a good time last night? Yes, we did, brothers and sisters. We had a good time last night. And what we've been, what we've been doing, we've just been setting the foundation for tomorrow. Because really everything we've been talking about is going to lead to tomorrow. Really, tonight really is the beginning of it. But nevertheless, brothers and sisters, uh, tomorrow we're going to begin our three-part series on the revelation of what the mark of the beast is due to time. We're going to um, have to deal with the identity of the beast power of Revelation chapter 13. There's two beasts mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 that we're going to be talking about. And then on Saturday night, what night did I say somebody? Saturday night, we're just going to unveil to you exactly what the mark of the beast is. We're going to walk you through it so that you will know exactly what the mark of the beast is. And brothers and sisters, this will be a life-changing uh, message on Saturday night. And brothers and sisters, please invite a friend, church member, or whoever, because brothers and sisters, a neighbor, whoever, because it's going to be a life-changing event. We praise God for the truth that it is in Jesus Christ. And on Sunday night, we're going to talk about coming out of Babylon, coming out of, come out of Babylon. So it's going to be, so Sunday night's going to be part two of what we're talking about tonight. And so we're going to be ready. Uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be ready by the grace of God. And the question is, will you be ready? Amen. So what we're going to do is, is that we're going to um, continue on with our music. We have our special music, again, by Sister Daphne. And she has sacrificed her time, amen, to sing to us the beautiful songs of Zion. Sister Daphne, the time is now yours. Praise the Lord. Oh, another night we get to study God hard. Oh, he's so good. He brought us here safely. He's kept us this far. He keeps his eye on it as insignificant as we may seem to other people. Each one of us is important to him. Why should I be discouraged? And why should the shadows fall? Why should my heart be so lonely? It longs for heaven. And home. when Jesus leaves my fortress, my constant friend is he, for his eyes on the sparrow. His tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose all doubt and fear. He calls me closer to him, and from sin he sets me free, for his eyes on this. And I know he watches me. His eyes on each sparrow. And I know 
Yes, I know. Praise God. And what we're going to do right now, we're going to get into our health spotlight. And we're going to talk about the gospel of health. And we've been dealing with what disease have we been dealing with this week, brothers and sisters? Diabetes. All right. Diabetes. And the Bible says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. And brothers and sisters, it's God's will for our health to prosper as we obey his word. And we're going to get right into it tonight. Now, we talked about the needs of a cell, and we understood, based on this right here, that um, disease and health begin at what level, somebody? The cellular level. And so at the cellular level, where disease and health begin. So therefore, the restoration process must begin at the cellular level. And we understand that all the cells together equal tissues, organs, and systems which equals and equates to the whole human body that God has created us, who we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we understand the number one need for a cell for restoration and preservation is the power of God through the Holy Spirit. This is where we pray and ask God for his healing power to be upon us. And as we continue to do that, we talk about the five needs of the cell. We talked about this already. Uh, I hope that you are uh, familiar with these. And so, brothers and sisters, and through lifestyle changes and lifestyle improvements, we are able to build our body in good health. And as we continue to go on, we asked the question the other night, can God cure diabetes? Yes. Amen. Why? Well, God can do anything. And with him, how many things are possible? All things are possible. We thank God for that. Now, we talk about the laws of health the eight laws of health, and we saw it as God's plan. God has a plan for diabetes. He has a plan for high blood pressure. He has a plan for all diseases. And all we got to do is yoke up ourselves with him. And by yoking up ourselves with him, praying to him and following the laws that he has ordained, God has promised us, brothers and sisters, that he would give us good health. So, amen. And so we talk about the aspect of food, and we understand that diseases in most cases revolves around these two things. Number one is what, somebody? Deficiency. And number two is what, somebody? Toxicity. So therefore, in order for a person to get well, we must supply the body where it is um, deficient and, of course, eliminate that which is toxic. And that comes through making some decisions and some lifestyle changes. And through Christ, we can definitely do all things. Now, we found out in the case of sickness, number one, that the cause must first be what, somebody? Ascertain. You got to find out what the cause for diabetes is. We talked about that the other night. Number two, uh, unhealthful conditions should be what somebody? Change. So whatever conditions there are that are unhealthful, you must recognize it and change it. And then notice this right here. Wrong habits are to be what somebody? Corrected. And then nature is to assist the assist in the effort and the body's effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. And that's a very, very uh, basic thing that must be done. And so what we must understand is, is that the first thing we must do is that we must ascertain the true character of the sickness and then work intelligently to remove the cause. And I think that we all on one accord with that. We've been talking about that the other night. We talked about the cause of diabetes, which is simply fat on the body and fat where somebody in the diet. So once we recognize these two things, what we must do is to remove both of these things and therefore supply the body with what it needs, whereby health and healing can take place. What do you say, doctor? Amen. So we understand that we must turn off the faucet. We must turn off the things that cause your body to be in a diabetic condition. And then what we must do, we must turn, what shall you eat? We must turn on the faucet and eat those things that promote good health. Amen. We talked about this. Now, we talked about food. Now, this is very important because type 2 diabetes often is usually caused through a long process of how we live and how we eat. I mean, that's just a fact, okay? But what happens is that 
What we must do is define what food is. Of course, food is something we consume. Food is something that we eat. But there's different types of food. We have junk food, which we know will make us sick. But when we talk about the food that God has ordained for our health, it will restore us into good health. So therefore, we must define what food is. Food is any what, somebody? Any substance consumed to provide nutritional support for an organism. So therefore, we're going to show you how to use food, brothers and sisters, to give you nutritional support in your fight against diabetes and really all manner of sickness and disease. All right, it is usually a plant or animal origin or both, and it contains essential nutrients such as carbohydrates, fats, protein, vitamins, or minerals. The substance is ingested and assimilated to where? The cell to produce energy, maintain life, and to sustain what somebody grow. And so this is what we do with food. Now, granted, uh, those of us go to Walmart, some go to public, some go to other stores to get their food. Some of us grow our food or a combination of all three. But nevertheless, when we go to when we when we have knowledge, we will know which aisle we should go to and which aisle we should avoid. Amen. Amen. And then what happens is that we can pray over our food, God will bless it. And then guess what? The Holy Ghost through the food can do his work of preserving our body. And if you're sick and dealing with something, he can preserve you from all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Genesis chapter 129 represents the original diet that God gave to man, which was a plant-based diet. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, if we would just add more of what God has ordained in the beginning, brothers and sisters, we can be on the road to hell. I call it the superior diet. What kind of diet, somebody? The superior diet. And not only that, we want to challenge each and every one of you really from this point on to eat more plant-based, what somebody? Foods. More plant-based foods. And that will give your body exactly what it needs. And we thank God for that. Now, this was a 21, this was a 21 day nutritional strategy that I did when my blood sugar was um, too high. And in three weeks time, the Lord blessed for my blood sugar levels to be normal. And brothers and sisters, I saw the miracle every time I checked my blood and I thank God for that. With God, how many things are possible, somebody? All things are possible. And as we said last night, what happens is this, if you're a diabetic or you got some disease, talk to your doctor before you do anything. We don't want nobody having any adverse effects. Do you understand this? We gotta put that disclaimer out. And so this is what I did. And I drank lemon water for 21 days and I eliminated the Sprite, eliminated the sodas, which I knew were gonna cause my blood sugar to go throughout the roof. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a thing called the law of cause and what somebody? Effect. What goes up must come up, somebody, down. If you put good stuff in your body, good will come out. If you put bad things in your body, bad things are gonna come out. Do you understand this, dear? And it was not God's design that mankind should suffer with illness and sickness, but nevertheless, Jesus made provision for all diseases. What do you say out there? And what happened is this way, we wanna show you something here. Now, this is, um, tonight what we wanna do, we wanna show you some um, herbs, or should I say a power drink, or a power food for diabetes. Now, does anybody know what this is called? Well, well first of all, what is that to my, to the left? It's called string what? String beans. And what you can do is, get, how many of you have a blender for juicing? What happens is you can go get some string beans from the, from the supermarket, pray over it, and juice it. And guess what? String bean juice is good for your blood sugar. Amen. Amen. It's been said to produce natural insulin, but what happens is you still want to back check that out. Amen. So what happens is if you're on insulin, you never tell anybody to get off the insulin. What we do is tell you to follow God's plan and let your doctor take you off the insulin. Amen. Amen. And so what happens is that this is um, something you can use. Uh, you can use this right here, string beans. And then the second thing you can get is this. This is called bitter melon. What kind of melon, somebody? Bitter melon. And it is called bitter melon for a reason. Do you understand this? And you know what watermelon is? Because it has a lot of water in it. Amen. So bitter melon has to taste what? Bitter. You can get this from the Asian supermarket. Or if you really just want to get it easily, you can just go to any health food store. Foods for Life has it, uh, uh, Whole Foods has it, and Sprouts has it, and you can go there and get some bitter melon. And let me tell you this right here, bitter melon is very potent, and it will lower your blood sugar, brothers and sisters. God has put his medicine right in your garden, amen? 
Amen. Yes, sir. Oh, come on, come on, I had a hand up. I thought you had a phrase with your hand to ask a question. All right. And so these are two herbs we can get. So therefore, what I want to do, yes. I, I just use better melon capsules. Yes, I use bitter melon capsules. And if you want to know what you should use the seeds, go on Google and Google will let you know. Amen. All right. Now, here's a power drink. What kind of drink, somebody? A power drink. Now, watch this right here. Now, if a person is struggling with high blood sugar, what you want to do is you want to get off of those things that are causing your sugar to go up. So I would suggest to you that if you would eliminate sodas, amen, amen, and just give this a try. And this is a power drink you can make for your blood sugar. Number one, how many ounces of carrot juice? Four. Four. And you can get carrot juice from the store. Am I right? You can get it from Walmart. You can go right across the street. Now, so what we're going to do is show you exactly what to do in order to get what you need in order for your blood sugar to be good. Four ounces of carrot juice. How many ounces? Four ounces of carrot juice. Go get some carrot juice from the store. You can get it in a drink, and then you can just use four ounces at a time. Put it in the blender, and then you can use you can you can take some bitter melon. You can cut it up, cut it in half, put it in the juicer, or you can just take the capsules and just dip it in there. A bitter melon capsules blended with one teaspoon of what? Somebody turmeric. Everybody has turmeric in their refrigerator. Am I right? Yes, and turmeric is good for diabetes. And then, next thing you want to do is get half a pound of fresh green beans, string beans blended. So you get a half a pound of that, and you just take it and you juice it all with the bitter melon and with the carrot juice. And let me tell you this right here, it does not taste good. But it's good for your body, amen? Amen, because you know what tastes good is not usually good for you, right? And then one scoop. Now, the last one is totally optional if you so choose. If you want to put something green in there, you can get some wheatgrass powder or some barley grass or alfalfa powder. You can do that if you want to. The last one is completely optional. But what happens is you do want to get some green support daily for your body because what happens is that will boost your health. What you do is you put it all together and you drink it daily. Do you understand this right here? And what you're doing is you're feeding your cells the things that it needs, whereby nutritional support is done, whereby your body can work optimally to where, guess what happens? You are reestablishing right conditions in the system by assisting nature after you have found the cause, change correct habits, and make the changes that are necessary for your blood sugar. And this is how you use food for diabetes. Because let me tell you this here, you use food in order to get it. Am I right, somebody? Am I right? Therefore, you can use food to eliminate it. What do you say out there about the power of Jesus Christ? What do you say out there? Amen. So, brothers and sisters, um, you can get all this from the store. Um, and then you can get oh, oh God, the aloe vera, the aloe vera juice there. But what happens is that when we talk about cancer and HIV, guess what? We're going to show you how to use food for that. We understand this for you. And so God can cure anything. Amen. Amen. And all it takes is a lot of faith and wisdom and knowledge and how to apply that wisdom and knowledge whereby God can and shall remove all manner of sickness and all manner of disease by the power of the Holy Spirit. What do you say? Amen. And so we thank God for that. So the question is, is somebody say, Dr. Oh, what do I do if I'm doing everything right and my blood sugar level is dropping? What do you do? What happens is if at night, morning, your blood sugar level drops to go 80, 80, eat a piece of fruit or orange or any fruit, and if the blood sugar level is 140 or below before bedtime, be careful with the amount of medication you take at that time. And please contact your health care provider so that they can make the necessary adjustments to your medication. So therefore, we never teach you to um, disregard Dr. Whoever. We tell you to work along with the doctor and with Dr. Jesus. What do you say out there? Amen. And then what happens is that usually what they'll do is they'll say, man, whatever you're doing, you just keep on doing. And they change your dosage. And you know what? You're on the road to health and healing. We thank God for the healing power of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So let's look at the book of Exodus 23 and verse 25. And this is a, a, a Bible promise. This is a healing scripture. We want to give you some healing scriptures that you can use. Whenever you're dealing with sickness and disease, you always want encouragement from God. 
And God has some encouraging scriptures here that can teach you how to enhance your health and your healing. Let's look at Exodus chapter 23 and verse 25. You can claim this promise every single day. You can pray over this every single day and ask God to do exactly as he says. Let me tell you this. Dr. O or no other naturopath has any power to heal of our own. Do you understand this? We have no wisdom, no power of our own to heal. Only God heals. What do you say? Amen. And so when we put our disease at the feet of Jesus and do what he says, God will turn things around. The Bible says in Exodus 23, verse 25, do you have it? The Bible says, and he shall serve the Lord to who? God, and he shall bless thy bread and bless thy what? Water, and I will take away what? Sickness away from the midst of thee. God says, I'll take thy diabetes away, amen? And so as we eat and drink, strategically, offensively, and defensively, in order for our body to attain optimum health, God performs the miracle by removing disease. Remember, by him removing the disease is a miracle from God himself. So therefore, you are to pray every day, Father, heaven, in the name of Jesus, take this sickness away from me as I cooperate with you, amen? And, oh, I, I almost forgot. I have my medicine right here, amen? Can I take a dosage of God's medicine right now? Hold on. And while you're doing that, let's turn to Exodus 15, 26. All right, let me drink my water. Mm -hmm. Amen, this water will bless, amen. I tell you, nothing like water that can quench your thirst, you hear me? Amen. All right. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. Let's see what the Bible says. Now, brothers and sisters, oh, I can't wait to get to the Bible tonight. We're going to talk about something that's really going to um, affect everybody. Now, here's what we're going to talk about. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. Now, the Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26, the Bible says, and he said, if thou wilt diligently hearken unto the voice of the whose somebody. The Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that does what's about it? Healeth thee. So therefore, we know that all healing comes from God. But if you want healing from God, you have to align yourself with what he says and do that which is right in his sight. Does that make a lot of sense? So what happens is that the science of healing, the true science of healing, the biblical science of healing always shows that there is to be cooperation between the divine and the human. Even when Jesus was healing people, he would ask them, do you have faith to believe that I can do this? Am I right? Amen. So you have to have faith, and faith without works is what somebody dead, and therefore the Holy Spirit comes and performs the miracle. Brothers and sisters, we thank God for his plan for diabetes. And brothers and sisters, um, what we want to do is, is that maybe we're going to try to see tomorrow if we can make this, can I, is it, how many would like me to give you this information on paper form? Okay, so I'll bring, we'll make some tonight and then we'll bring them tomorrow to where you can have information on this. And then um, we'll talk about another disease. Matter of fact, I like to talk about cancer. Can we talk about cancer? How do you know, some, how do you know somebody that has either has cancer or has had? Brothers and sisters, next to diabetes, cancer is another killer as well, too. And we're going to show you that God even has a plan for that. And guess what? There's a, or there's, there is a power break for cancer, and I can take you to Walmart after here to show you exactly what to do. Amen? Amen. Now, what is the number one fear of cancer for men? What's the, the cancer that is most common that men get? Prostate. We're going to show you how to uh, we're going to deal with we're going to do with a program with prostate cancer. We're going to deal with prostate enlargement. Amen. And then what's the number one cancer feared by women? Breast. Guess what, brothers? Whether it's breast or the prostate or whatever it is, God can cure it all. Amen. Because we serve a mighty God. Amen. All right. Now, we brothers and sisters, tonight um, is going to be a serious message tonight. Are you ready for it? I need you to fasten your seat, girl, because we're going to show you some things that uh, are going to transpire in these last days that you need to know about. Amen. Uh, we talked about a lot of things here. And what we're going to do is, is that we're going to get into the study 
as we talk about how the Tower of Babel is being rebuilt right now, symbolically through Babylon. And what we're going to do, we're going to get into that tonight. So I want you to pay close attention, pay good notes, and brothers and sisters, tonight is the foundational topic for tomorrow. Do you understand this, lady? And what we're going to do is, before we do that, we're going to have Sister Daphne to come up one more time, and she's going to sing us a meditation, and then we're going to talk about our study for tonight. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Do you love God more than anything? Do you love God? Really love God? Do you love Him more than anything? Do you love God? You no longer will be the embassy of all the host of heaven. Do you love God more than your car or your home? Do you love God? Really love God? Do you love him more than all you own? Do you love God? Do you love him more than family? Then really love him if you do. And let the whole world know. That's all he asks of you. Do you love God more than your job or your friends? Do you love God? Really love God? And will you love him till the very end? Do said, what must thing, what must thing, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him exactly what he had to do. He told him what the told him what God said and did. He said, one thing thou lackest. And he told him exactly what, what he needed to do. And you know what happened? He turned away from him, brothers and sisters. Jesus, when he said, I was the, I'm the bread of life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by me, the Bible says many of his disciples turned back and walked no more. With him. Brothers and sisters, there are people who are turning their backs on the truth. You hear me? But the work is still going to go forward. Amen. And as much as it hurts for one person to leave him, do you understand that there's going to be somebody else that's going to take their place 
and follow God. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 7, we're going to talk about this. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that you would guide and lead me in this study, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to look at the book of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Now we're familiar with what it says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But they which do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, we're, we're familiar with that. Now, so we understand that having a profession does not mean that you have any possession. Do you understand this of Jesus? But nevertheless, God is challenging us to see how much we really love the Lord. Do you understand this? And you know what he's going to do? He's going to test all of Huntsville. Everybody in here is being tested every single day. And let me tell you this, what we're going to cover tonight what we're going to cover Friday, tomorrow, what we're going to cover Saturday, especially Saturday night, and Sunday is going to really be a test for somebody in this room. Do you understand this right here? But you know what? We want you, let me say this, if you have any questions, all you got to do is just ask. Amen? Because it has been said that the foolish question is the one that's never asked. Do you understand this? So if you say, Pastor, I need you to sit down with me and make this a little bit more clearer, or I got some questions because my pastor said, my mama said, my daddy said, or the man on the television on the internet said such and such. And brothers and sisters, I will sit down with you. Amen. I will spend as much time as possible and lay it all out in the Bible. And if there is a question that I do not have the answer for on the spot, you know what I'm going to tell you? I don't know. But if you give me a day or two, I'll get back with you. Amen. Amen. We've been walking together for almost a week, brothers and sisters. And I think I can tell you that after these nights, because I don't think any one of you would not be coming if you didn't have any confidence that I'm telling you the truth. You need to stand this right here. But what we want you to do is, is to go back to the Bible to make sure. Amen. Now, what does the Bible say? The Bible makes it very plain in the book of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. The Bible tells you where to go. The Bible says, enter you in after what gate, somebody? Straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to us, somebody. Destruction, and many there be which go in their act. The mark of the beast is going to lead many to destruction, but nevertheless, many are going to go that way anyway. Do you understand this? So you have to expect that only a few are going to walk the straight and narrow way. Why? Look at verse 14. Because straight is the gate. And narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that what somebody find it. So what you must understand is only a few are going to find the way that's going to lead to heaven. The devil makes the road to hell so broad to where a lot of people are walking that way thinking they're going to go to heaven anyway. Do you understand this? But God's way is a straight and narrow way, and if we're going to go to heaven, God commands us to walk that way. What do you say out there? Amen? And there's no excuses. And let me tell you this, way: no excuse. Because a lot of people judge truth by, oh, who's that person speaking? Hmm? They judge by who is it being proclaimed by rather than asking the question, is it true? Do you understand this? If a drunk man came to you and he was cussing through his mouth teeth and said, Jesus is the way to heaven, you better give it life or you're going to go to hell. As wrong as he may be, he's still telling you the truth. Do you understand this? Amen. Now, you shouldn't be cussing and drinking, but you know what I'm trying to say. So what happens is we can't judge truth by things that people are, are judging it by. Because brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. In the end of time, the Bible says, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And let me tell you this. Many more will be deceived in the last days than those who are undeceived. Do you understand this? So what we're going to do is we're going to take you to the Bible, and we're just going to just tell you what God says. Amen? We've covered a lot of traction this meeting, and we've been having a good time. Amen? We talk about it because we understand that time is what, somebody? Running out. Time is running out on this earth's history. We know what's going on. We know all the things, the calamities that are happening. Something is getting ready to happen to lead us to the end of time and brothers and sisters the answer that the devil is going to propose in the last days is will you worship the beast power in the last days 
and we're going to talk about them tomorrow night. And your homework for tomorrow night, we have a homework assignment for you, is to read Revelation chapter 13, 1 through 18. It's only 18 verses, and we're going to break down all 18, and then tomorrow we're going to tell you what 666 means. Amen. That number of a man. We're going to tell you who that man is, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to put it up there, and you're going to do some counting tomorrow night. If you can count, if you can do addition, then you definitely can come here tomorrow night. Amen. And you can take a picture of this, share it on Facebook, Instagram, wherever your social media platforms. Get us to your mama, your dad, your pastor, whosoever brings us the sisters. And guess what? It's going to be a packed house, brothers and sisters. Let's continue on. The Bible says, what book did I say? Did I? Revelation? Oh, your yeah, Revelation. Okay, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to talk about this tonight. Now, we know about this new world order, and now we're going to start putting it all together. Now. We're going to put it all together now. And we're going to just make it plain because you have come here for that. Okay. Now, we understand what's going to happen. Uh, Jesus is going to win ultimately. Amen. And those of us who have not only accepted Jesus, Jesus says, if any man comes after me, you're going to come after me and be my disciple in these last days, you must take up your what, somebody? Cross. And bear it every day and follow him. Jesus makes it very plain that following him is not easy. The devil is not going to make it easy just because he left him and decided to serve Jesus. See, understand this. He's going to try to make your way very hard. He's going to try to call a lot of stuff to happen in your life to where you don't see no need to really do what's right or even go to church. But let me tell you this right here. In order to walk with Jesus, you must be willing to make a sacrifice. Amen. And it's kind of like a marriage for all of those who are married. In order to make your marriage work, you got to make some sacrifices. And I raise somebody, everybody that's married knows that. It's going to be a sacrifice of your time, sacrifice of a lot of stuff, brothers and sisters. But you do it because you love the person you made a covenant with God with. And we made a marriage covenant with God. And in order for us to really walk with him, we have to make a sacrifice. And if you make that sacrifice, let me tell you, it's going to pay off in heaven. What do you say out there? And we know what's going on with the truth. And we know what's going on with the new world order. We know what's going on. But let me tell you this right here. God has sent a message. And what we're going to do, we're going to talk about it tonight as we talk about this time. Let's look at Revelation 14 and verse 8. Do you have it? All right. What does the Bible say? Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. We're going to just, we're going to just identify who Babylon is. And we're going to make it very logical to where you would know that Dr. O wasn't just making this stuff up. Revelation chapter 14, verse 8 says, and there followed another what? Angel after them. The Bible says there followed another angel saying, Babylon is what somebody? Fallen is what somebody? Fallen, that great city, because she made how many nations somebody? All nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The Bible says that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is not a literal fall, but this is a spiritual fall. What kind of fall, somebody? A spiritual fall because she made all nature drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So what happens is she's been spiritually fornicating with the kings of the earth. And because of that, there's going to be a moral spiritual fall. And God don't want his people involved in that. Do you understand this? And God is so serious about it. He says it again in Revelation chapter 18. Let's look at Revelation, the 18th chapter. Revelation, the 18th chapter, we're going to look at verse 1. Now, Revelation chapter 18, and before we go, in, in order to understand what we're going to talk about tonight, it is very essential to understand where this term, where this name, Babylon, comes from and what it entails in these last days. Revelation 18, verse 1, do you have it? It says, and after these things, I saw another angel coming down from where, somebody? Heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his what somebody glory. And let me tell you this: that means that gross darkness will cover the earth. But when the glory of this angel hits to preach the end time message, the whole earth will be illuminated. Everybody gonna know the truth. Saying in verse two, and he cried mightily with the what kind of voice? A strong voice saying, "Babylon the great is fallen." It's fallen. Did you see that? We read that before in Revelation chapter 14. But it says here again, Babylon the Great is fallen. It's fallen. And it's become the habitation of what somebody devils. That means that Babylon's going to be completely possessed of the devil, brothers and sisters. It's going to be controlled by demons. 
And the Bible says, and the hold of every what somebody? Foul spirit. And notice what it says right here in a cage of every unclean and hateful what somebody? Bird. It's going to be so bad in Babylon. Verse 3, the Bible says, and all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed what somebody? Fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Somebody's going to get rich off of Babylon in the last days. Do you understand this? But as the saying goes, not all that is but good money, all that is money. Okay, a lot of money does not mean it's good money. Am I right, somebody? But look at verse 4. It's going to get so bad to where in verse 4 of the Bible says, and I heard another voice, verse 4 says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people have mercy. Why? That you be not partakers of her what? Sins and that you receive not of her what? Plagues. God is going to send judgment on Babylon and this judgment is going to lead to the lake of fire. And before this time comes, God says, come out of her, my people. My people represents, and you know what that means? That means that the majority of God's people who are saved, born again, and love God are in Babylon and they don't even know it. And the Bible says they're to do what somebody come out of Babylon. Do you understand this? Let me separate yourself from her because I'm going to send judgment upon Babylon. And remember, back in the book of Genesis, God had Lot in Babylon, not Babylon, Sodom and Gomorrah. And before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, somebody had to come out. Am I right? And only a few came out. But nevertheless, when God's people came out, then God sent judgment. Do you understand this right here? So judgment can't fall upon nobody until the people of God come out of Babylon. And brothers and sisters, it's time for people to come out of Babylon in Huntsville. What do you say, out there? And let me tell you this right here. It, and that to, to be in Babylon is not the disgrace. But to remain in Babylon after you've been shown that you're in Babylon, that's the disgrace, brothers and sisters. So therefore, when you know better, it's not really to what somebody do better. And we're going to tell the word of God, tell the truth. But let's go to Revelation 18 and verse 2. Look at the last part. We read it again. The Bible says and he cried mightily with the strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and it's become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. But notice what it says, in a cage of every unclean and hateful what somebody Bird. I want you to mark that part down in your Bible. It says a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. What in the world does that mean? Well, you know what the beautiful thing about the Bible is? You don't have to guess. All you got to do is find the right scripture and God will take it to you. Take it to you. Amen. So let's go to the book of Jeremiah in chapter five. Let's go to the Old Testament because the Old Testament here, this scripture here explains what it means. Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. And we're going to look at verse 27. It uses the same language that you just read in the book of Revelation chapter 18. It uses the same language. Notice this what it says right here. Revelation chapter uh, 5, not Revelation, to, to Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse what somebody? 27. So all you got to do is you call it what's called a, a Bible chain to where you take a text and see where it correlates with another scripture, which gives it to give more meaning. Do you understand this? The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5, verse 27. Do you have verse 27? It says, and as a cage is full of what? Birds. Can we read that in Revelation 18? A cage of every ugly and hateful bird. So Jeremiah is getting ready to tell you what it means to have a cage full of birds. It says, as a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of what, somebody? Houses of worship. Full of what, somebody? Deceit. Therefore, they become great and then wax and what, somebody? Rich. So therefore, when the Bible says that Babylon is fallen, that means that Babylon is going to be packed with a lot of people, brothers and sisters. But what happens is there's going to be houses of deceit because the Bible says that Babylon will be filled with demonic spirits deceiving people. Do you understand this right here? And so people are going to be deceived in these churches and guess what? These religions and they're going to be told they need to go along with the Babylonian system of worship to worship the beast and therefore brothers and sisters, a lot of people are going to stay in Babylon, but the people of God will come out of her. What do you say out there? 
So in order to understand who Babylon is, we got to go to who ancient Babylon is in the Bible, amen? So what we're going to do, we're going to give you a little small, a short history lesson. And then on Sunday, we will be able to unpack it some more on Sunday, okay? So what happens is that what we cover today will be covered on Sunday of next week. And brothers and sisters, I want you to listen very carefully. Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 10. Now, what you will find out is this. God did not create Babylon. The devil did. And the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. Amen. That God is not the author of what, somebody? Confusion. Now, you want to know this right here. Now, the definition of Babylon is twofold. But I'm going to give you the first definition right now. The name Babylon, you want to write this down. The name Babylon means confusion. It means what, somebody? Confusion. You need to know it. All right. How do I know? Let's go to Genesis chapter 10. Now, notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. Now, Noah had three sons. He had Shem, he had Ham, and he had Japheth. Japheth is the father of Europeans, Indians, and Asians. Uh, 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 Shem is the father of the Semite Arabian nations, of course, the Jews. But the Ham nation was symbolic of a people of African descent. Do you understand this right here? Which included the Canaanites. And so from the line of Ham, um, Ham had a son. His name was Cush. His name was what, somebody? Cush. And one of the ancient names of Cush was Ethiopus. Ethiopus. And the name Ethiopus comes from where we have a country called Ethiopia. And the name Cush, they were known as the people of the sun because they were very dark. Do you understand this right here? Now, this is not a lesson in black history or history at all, but I'm just giving you some background detail to know who these people are. Now, the Bible says in verse 8, and Cush begat somebody called what somebody? Nimrod. And one of the names of Nimrod was Rebellious Panther. Rebellious Panther. What kind of panther? Rebellious. And what color is a panther? Black. All right. So he begat Nimrod, and the Bible says in verse 10 that he became, okay, verse 8, excuse me, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And Nimrod was so influential, the Bible says that he began some kingdoms. He started building some cities. And look at verse 10. Verse 10 says in the book of Genesis chapter 10, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Eric and Akkad and Kalnah in the land of Shinar. That's where Babylon came from, the land of Shinar. But notice what it is. The beginning of his kingdom was called what, somebody? Babel. And this is where the Tower of Babel came, which tells me that the originator of this temple or this tower was Nimrod, who's the one that began the kingdom of Babel. Now, when was Nimrod born? If you read the Bible carefully, he was born after the flood. Because when Noah went into the ark, it was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and his three daughters, daughters-in-law, and their three wives. And after they came out of the ark, they started having children, and they started populating the earth. And what you will find out in the Bible, and you just got to do that. Now, don't take my word, but it's in Genesis chapter 10. What you will find out is 100 years after the flood. How many years? 100 years after the flood, that's when the earth became divided by languages. How do I know? Because there was a scripture in Genesis chapter 10 where there was a certain man born, and the Bible makes it very plain. That's when the division began. So after the flood, a hundred years went by, and a hundred years, you can be you can be yet a lot of people. Am I right, somebody? I come from a family in Honduras on my mother's side called the Brooks family to where in 1771, my great, 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 great grandfather, Peter Brooks, one man in Cayman Islands, had about five or six kids. When I got the history right on my computer. And do you know from all that, there are tens of thousands of people with the Brooks last name, and they don't know that they're related, but I know. Amen. And I believe in that answer. I went down to Honduras and just met family with that last name. And I was able to show, look here, your grandfather was my great-grandfather's brother. And they were like, what? And all that kind of stuff. 
So if in 100 and 200 years, I can have tens of thousands of people just on one side of my family, just imagine these men that were having many babies, brothers and sisters. And what happened was it was thousands of people upon the earth. And what happened was that God said, I will never destroy the world again by flood. Did God say that? And what did God do as a sign to give every human being the comfort that he would never flood the world again? He made a thing called a rainbow. Am I right, somebody? Amen. So the rainbow is not symbolic of homosexuality, even if they stole it from God. Do you understand this right here? The rainbow really is a symbol of God's covenant that he would never destroy the world again by flood. And it has rained many times on this earth and has never flooded again. So God is true to his word. What do you say out there? So what happened was is that when these people didn't believe God, what they said is, we're going to build a tower. We're going to build it so high to where if a flood comes again, it will never, and we'll be able to just go in this tower, and we're going to be saved. Brothers and sisters, when God says something, you got to believe it, and don't ever call him a liar. Amen? So let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 11. A hundred years after the flood, this tower was built. So let's go to Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis chapter 11, we're going to start at verse 1. The Bible tells us something. It's a history lesson. Now, the Bible says in verse 1, and the whole earth, the what earth? How much there? The whole earth was of one language and what's somebody? Speech. That means that everybody spoke the same language and everybody talked the same. There was no accents. Do you understand this right here? I can, I can listen to where I can listen to how a person talk and almost tell where they come from. You know how that is, right? But what happened was everybody spoke the same language and everybody spoke the same speech. And let me ask you a question Do you know what language it was that all men spoke? I don't know, but the Bible doesn't say, Amen. It's not important. Do you understand this? But look at verse two. And it came to pass as they were as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another in verse three, "Go to let us make brick and let's burn them thoroughly." And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, "Go to let us build a what somebody a city and a what somebody a tower." That, notice this right here, whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad from the face of the whole earth. Right to this scattered abroad, they want to come together as one. Am I right, somebody? Does that sound familiar? And the Bible says in verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is what, somebody? The people is what? One. And they all have one what? language, and this they began to do, and nothing will be restrained from them, which they have what somebody imagined to do. Go to verse 7, let us go down, and there confound their language, the Bible says, that they may not understand one of what somebody speech, God sound, or confuse the languages. So therefore, brothers and sisters, they can't be able to know more. And verse 8, and the, so the Lord scattered abroad from fence from all the face of the earth, and they left off to build the what somebody city. And look at verse 9, and therefore is the name of it called what somebody? Babel or Babel, because the Lord did their confound, or in the Hebrew, they confused the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter abroad from the face of all the earth. And brothers and sisters, on Sunday, I'm going to show you how folk left there and was able to get to North America without going across the Atlantic Ocean. I'm going to show it to you on Sunday night. Amen. But that's not important for right now. So the reason why it was called Babel is because God confused the languages. Am I right, somebody? And this is the capital of what is called Babylon because, brothers and sisters, Babylon means what? Confusion. So we see here this Tower of Babel. This was um, a tower, and you must understand that the religion of Babylon, brothers and sisters, is what we're trying to get to tonight. And what we're going to do is we're going to just give you a short history lesson. Now, when the religion of Babylon was spread, it was not the religion of God, it was the religion of Satan. It was known as paganism or sun worship. It was known as paganism or what, somebody? Sun worship. We still have paganism today. Now, what happens is, how do I know? It's because 
the, 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 after the Tower of Babel, the first world country, the first great empire after the flood, probably after Nimrod, was the Egyptian Empire, the Indistanics. And the Egyptian Empire were a race of sun worshippers. You see the sun right there, right there in the middle. They worship the sun, and what happened was gold was the color of choice. They used it as an object of worship because gold was the color of the sun. Therefore, they mimicked the sun. And therefore, what happened was is that the name of the king of Egypt was called what? What was he? What was he called? Pharaoh, which they believed was the sun god in human form. Ama Ra. Ra was worshipped in Egypt as the god to be worshipped. And Canaan was worshipped as Baal, and in other countries, the sun had different names. In Greek, he was called Zeus, and all of these things. The sun was a primary god of worship. We're going to show you about this on, on Sunday night. So what happened was, is that, I'm going to show you some notes here that you will want to take down. The name Babel and Babylon, this is going to make a lot of sense as we talk about who Babylon is. And what you're going to find out is that there is no new thing under the West, somebody, sun. And we're going to show you that the religion of Babylon is in existence today through this Babylonian horde in Revelation chapter 17. Look what the Bible says. Notice what it says in here. Nimrod was the first what's the Bible? He was the first pagan king. All false religion came from Nimrod. Number two, you will find out that the first pagan city built after the flood was what somebody? Babel. Now, Another name for Babel, besides confusion, they attached to was called the Gate of God. And when you say God, we're talking about God with the little G, not with the big G. So what happened was they were trying to replace the religion of God upon the earth, and that's why God called a man named Abram, which later became Abraham, to hold to the truth. Thereby, God will call forth the Jewish Hebrew nation to be his representatives. Why? Because everybody was worshiping false gods. Now, all false religion begins with who, somebody? Nimrod, and it has spread in the many forms of non-Christian religion, and it was built upon the religion of West somebody? Sun worship. So therefore, the religion of Nimrod was the religion of sun worship. You need to keep that in the back of your minds, brothers and sisters. We don't have time to get into all of this, but there's a lot of history in just one picture. But we don't have time to get into that. But what happens is giving you the background, the Babylonian religion was built around upon what somebody? Paganism in some words. And brothers and sisters, this paganism is in existence right now in 2022. And brothers and sisters, who is responsible for it? The Bible calls her the whore of revelation. The Bible calls her Babylon. And we're not talking about literal Babylon. We're talking about spiritual Babylon. Somebody say spiritual Babylon. Spirit talking about spiritual Babylon. So we're talking about the spiritual Babylonian war mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. And now what we're going to do, we're going to break it down. Are you ready to break this down for me? Amen. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. Revelation 17 and verse 1. And I'm going to leave this picture up here for a while because we're going to just break it down. Because brothers and sisters, a lot of people have been confused on what this symbolizes. But if you, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to show you exactly who Babylon is. And brothers and sisters, it's going to blow your mind. Some of you already know, but we're going to break this down to you. And remember, the Bible says, come out of her, my who's about it? People. So guess what? You have God's people in Babylon. And remember, the shame is not to not to be in Babylon, but the shame is to stay in Babylon after you've been told to come out. Do you understand this? When God is telling you from the Bible. Let's go to the Bible. What does the Bible say in Revelation chapter 17 and verse what? One. We're going to look at a couple of verses. Revelation 17 and verse 1. The Bible says, and there came one of the seven angels, the Bible says, which had the seven vials. And he talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great what? For that sitteth upon many what? Waters. Look at verse 50. You see, look at this screen right here. Do you see her sitting upon many waters? Do you see that? So what happens is, what does that mean? That's what it says. But the question is, what does that mean? Look at verse 15. Verse 15 tells you what it means when she sits upon many waters. All we got to do is just identify the correct symbol, let the Bible interpret itself, and you don't have to guess. All you got to do is know. And let me tell you this right here. We're going to make it so plain to where you'll never have to guess again. What do you say out there? The Bible says, and he saith unto me, 
The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and what somebody? Tongues. So therefore, this woman that sits upon many waters, it means that she is sitting in control of the affairs of planet Earth. That means that this part system will be in control of the world. And I have an article that's going to blow your mind to show you that the Lord is seeking to be the ruler of the world, even right now. Do you see that in the Bible? So what's going to happen is right now, political figures are controlling the world. But in the last days, this symbolic woman, Babylon's going to control the whole world. How do I know? Verse 18 tells you. Let's look at verse 18. Verse 18, the Bible says, and the woman which thou sawest is that great what? City that reigneth over the kings of the host of it. Earth. So this woman is going to reign over everybody. That means that all these political powers will no longer have the power to tell you what to do without the woman telling her have mercy. It reminds me of the Old Testament when you had Jezebel controlling the king. Am I right, somebody? Jezebel controlled Ahab. This is the spiritual Jezebel. This is the modern day Jezebel in the last days controlling the king, controlling the state. And whatever the woman says, the king is going to do. Have mercy. And everybody's going to be drunk. And you see this right here? This seems that the whole entire world, and guess what? This includes Huntsville. Most people in Huntsville are going to be controlled by the woman. You hear me? But what we're going to do is we're going to tell you to come out of her my hood. People. So therefore, let's go to Revelation 17 and verse 1 again. The Bible says, not only does she sit upon many waters, the Bible identifies her spiritually as a whore. As a what somebody? A whore. Now watch this right here. Now, you can write this down. Ezekiel chapter 16. You can read this tonight. Whenever God says, you just read the whole chapter. And matter of fact, let me just give you the text. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 28. If I'm off by a verse or two, you just read the chapters there. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 16, you will find out that when God's church went into apostasy, the Bible called it a whore. So what we're seeing is the Bible uses the same terminology of a church that has apostatized. A church that is what somebody? Apostatized, and the Bible calls her a what? A whore. So what we're seeing right here, we're seeing the church that's going to rule the world through a union of church and what somebody stay. Look at verse two. With whom the kings of the earth have committed what somebody? Fornication with the whore. Meaning that if the kings of the earth represent political powers, therefore, brothers and sisters, the woman that she fornicates with tells me that the separation of church and state will be in jeopardy, and the day is going to come when religion will rule the political sphere, and guess what's going on right now? They have a thing called Christian nationalism, which they're trying to do in the elections to the Republican Party. This is not a Republican or Democrat sermon, but just what's going on, to where they're trying to control the government, just like the Bible said they would do. So what happens is I see the signs of the time right upon us. So therefore, we got to tell the people. So the Bible says that the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk of the wine of her fornication. We're going to look at a couple of more verses and then we just going to get to the bottom line. Verse three says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the way of somebody and wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast for the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and how many horns. And the woman was arrayed in what two colors? What are the two colors right there? Purple and what somebody? Scarlet. That's very important. Now, this is going to blow your mind. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filled with its of her fornication. And in verse 5, the Bible says, and upon her forehead was a name written. And the Bible says her name is Babylon the Great. Notice what the Bible says. She's the mother. That means she's not alone, brothers and sisters. The mother of what somebody? Paul. That means the Holly Holly women are connected to the mother. And then on Sunday night, we're going to tell you who the Hollers are. But tonight, I'm going to tell you who the mama is. Back when I was growing up, if I said your mother so your mama so this, we'd be very good fight. I'm going to raise somebody. But I'm going to talk about this woman right here who people are part of the mother and don't even know about it, but it's time for them to depart from this mother. What do you say out there? Look at the Bible. Let's look at verse 9. 
According to verse 9, the Bible says, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The Bible says that seven heads are seven what somebody? Mountains are seven hills. In the Greek, on which the woman what somebody? Sits. This woman sits upon seven heads to the mountains, seven hills. And now I'm just going to show you who this harlot is. Notice, the Bible says she had how many horns? How many horns? Ten. Now hold on now. Remember back in the book of Daniel and the book of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, there was ten toes. And in Daniel 7, there were ten horns. Remember that? I gotta go back. I gotta go back now. I gotta go back. So what happens is before we go any further, I'm going to show you the geographical location of where this woman is from. That means that this woman that sits upon seven heads and has ten horns, notice this right here. She comes from Watch this right here. She comes from Western Europe. Because in the book of Daniel, after the Roman Empire, it broke up into 10 divisions, which were the 10 horns of Daniel 7, meaning the geographical location of this woman is from Europe, brothers and sisters. Not America, not Africa, none of that stuff is European. So when somebody says Babylon is America, that is not true. Babylon is European. But God goes a little bit more deep. So the Bible goes deeper, and God says, I'm not just going to tell you here, I'm going to go to the very spot where you would know where this harlot resides. And we're going to show you in just a second. Give me a couple of more minutes now. We're going to show you this. Let me get past all of this right here. Are, are you learning something? All right, now, give me just a couple of more minutes. We're just going to make this point plain because you need to know who this woman is and where she's from. Notice the Bible says she has how many colors? Two, which is purple and what? All right. Now, let's go to the screen here. Now, I'm going to show you this right here. Now, as you look at the screen, you may want to write this down or take a picture. You need to be faster to take a picture. In Bible prophecy, a woman equals a what? A church. How do I know? All you got to do is read Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2, Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 16. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in the New Testament, it said the church is a bride. Am I right? Who is a woman? Now watch this right here. Now watch this. The Bible says this woman which is a corrupt church. It's an apostate church. Notice this phrase. She was in fornication, which we said is an unholy what somebody? You can never be an unholy woman with the kings of the what somebody? The earth, which are the governments of the earth. We know that just by implication. So therefore, brothers and sisters, this king, this kingdom, or this woman will make everybody jump with what kind of doctrine, somebody? Because it's not literal one, it's spiritual one. We'll talk about that on Sunday night. But listen to this right here. The Bible says that she sits upon how many heads? Seven heads. And if you go to the Greek, and the Greek word for the word mountain is hills. That's why different versions of the Bible says seven hills. Notice this. The seven hills is from what city, somebody? Rome. Brothers and sisters, the geographical location of the harlot is in the city of Rome, which is in the country of Italy, which is in Western Europe. That is the capital of Babylon. Hold on. So, are you with me now? Brothers and sisters, before we go any further, if there was a serial rapist running around, he raped a hundred women, and all hundred of them died, all this city would be set on alert. Am I right, somebody? And the number one question you want to know is, who, what does he look like? Is he white? Is he black? Is he Spanish? Is he what nationality? You want to know, you want to know the color, the height, you want to know tattoos. Am I right, somebody? You want to know all the descriptions. How would it feel if I knew that that person was in this room right now, which he is not? And I didn't tell you. And then some man comes and says, I need a ride to the store. Give me a ride to the store. And then you give him a ride and then he takes you somewhere else and makes you. 
and maybe you survived that. And they said, you know what? I'm sorry you got raped, but I knew who the rapist was all along. Would you be happy with me? No. So it'd be better for me to say, look, it's him right there, right? Call the police right now. I'm going to get three deacons right now. They need to strap them up. Let's call the police. Amen. And we get our $20,000 reward from Crime Stoppers. Amen. Amen. That's what I should do, right? But the Bible, watch this right here, identifies who this woman is. The Bible identifies who Babylon is. And guess what? I'm going to tell you right now. Amen. All right. Now, the Bible said that Babylon was arrayed in two colors, purple and what, somebody? Scarlet. So what we got to do is this. We got to find a church. Find a what, somebody? A church in the city of Rome in Western Europe where you have priests or pastors were in purpose. And let me tell you this, since the 16th century, even before that, all prophecies were united on who it was. This got nothing to do with no denomination. It was just plainly people just reading the Bible and look, oh, there he is right there. Amen. And I'm going to tell you who it is. Are you ready for it? I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to show you. Amen. All right, there's only one church. How many churches? And that is the Roman Catholic Church. That's that one, brothers and sisters. The Bible says the woman was arrayed in purple and what somebody? And what do the priests got on? Purple and scarlet. Why? Because purple and scarlet are the official colors of the Roman Catholic priesthood. You didn't know that. That they wear purple and scarlet just as the Bible said. Even if you was literate and could not read, just know that this woman where purple and scarlet is the church of Rome. You need to take a picture of me. You need to next to your father. He's the next to your father. Amen. He's the next to your family. This we done found. We done found her. You know how a man says, "Mama, I done found the woman." Right? Am I right? Yeah. The woman says, "Hunt, daddy, I done found my husband. Girlfriend, I done found my husband." Right? Well, guess what? We done found the heart. We done. Found her. And it's the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, the Bible says, "Come out of her, my people." So therefore, we're not talking about individual Catholic people that love Jesus. Amen. We're talking about an organizational system that the Bible calls the Father. Do you understand this right here? Do you understand this right here? So notice this right here. You see purple and scarlet right there. Man, with the Pope going on. Do you see the scarlet? You see the purple, just as the Bible said. Isn't that beautiful? It didn't take us three, three, four years to figure it out. It's right there in the Bible. And all Protestants, of, of, of all Protestants, were unanimous. That's why you have all these denominations, the Lutheran Church. Martin Luther knew the Pope was on Babylon. That's why he left. And all these people started the Baptists, but they all knew it, brothers and sisters. They knew that Rome was Babylon and had a prophetic part to play in the last days. But remember, the Bible says the kings of the earth will commit fornication. It is very funny that I see kings coming to the Pope. Every almost every month, even next week, France, Nigeria, and another country is going to be with it. Why are you going there? You know why? Because they get ready to fornicate with the Lord. Do you hear me? This is deep. Notice this. And the head of the Catholic Church is called who? Somebody? No, he's a Jesuit, but the head of the Catholic Church is what is his title? The Pope. <laughs> But there's a couple of problems with this because they teach that a priest can't get married. But where in the Bible saying that at? The Bible says that a bishop can be the husband of one wife. So a bishop can't be married. Am I right? So they follow the tradition down the Bible. And then the second problem is they call him father. They call him holy father. But I'm going to show you two texts to show you that you're not supposed to call this man father. Let's go to the book of Matthew 23. Well, you, see, you see why? You see why this? You see why we're holding this meeting? Because let me tell you this right here. 
I've got information to show you of how the world religions and the world kingdoms are getting ready to join up with the Pope right now in 2022. Do you understand this? And God cannot keep his hand on this forever. Do you understand this, Ray? So what Monday is going to say, you can do what you want to do. Amen? But before that happens, everybody in Huntsville has to know this. That's why we got this big old building here. Amen? Amen. So we can fit many people. Amen? Amen. Open thy mouth wide, the Bible says, and I will fill it. What book did I say? Matthew. Matthew 23 and verse 9. Look what the Bible says. You got verse 9? It says, and call no man in the religious sense. Your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is where somebody, and it happened. So you don't call me Father Isaac, because my first name is Isaac. Don't call me Father Isaac, Father O, whatever. You can call me Pastor O, Bishop O. You can call me by my first name. I'm not, I'm not part of the title. See the standards or anything. But the Bible makes it very plain. Call no man your father on the earth in the religious sense. He was standing there. Give no man a title that gives him control over your conscience. Have you heard of the term don't drink the Kool-Aid? The man who did that, Jim Jones, guess what they would call him? They would call him father. Have you heard of a man named Father Divine? They called him Father. That man believed he was Jesus on this earth. Sweet Daddy Grace. R. Even R. Kelly was having those girls calling him Daddy. Have mercy. And look what happened to him. To call no man your father. Now you can call your husband daddy. Amen. In a romantic sense. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. All right. Baby. All right. You know, what does a man call his wife? Hey, baby. And you got some men that call their wives. Mom, are you with me? It's a term of endearment. We ain't talking about romance. Come on, religion. You understand this right here. Don't you call no man father, whatever. And what do they call the priest? Father so-and-so. Am I right? So they blaspheme. Let's go to the book of St. John. We got to look at St. John. St. John chapter 17. Another problem I, I, I have with the Pope biblically is that they call him Holy Father. Do they call him Holy Father? I'm not making this up. Let's look at St. John chapter 17 and we're going to look at verse um, 16. St. John chapter 17 and verse 11. Those are what the Bible says. All right, now Jesus is praying to God, his Father. Amen. And those are what the Bible says. I am now no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to be holy who? Who did Jesus call? What, what did Jesus call God the Father? Holy Father. And what do they call the Pope? That's blasphemy, brothers and sisters, to call him Holy Father. Never going to forget when I was a child when I first saw the Pope on television. He came to New York. This is back in the day. And then when he was flying back to Rome, I remember the newscaster saying, it can truly be now said, our Father, which I am. That's blasphemy, brothers and sisters. And so what happens is, even though he may wear white, even though it may look holy and sanctified, according to God, somebody say God, it's Babylon. And this tower of Babel is being built through the Catholic Church. And this, and you know what the Catholic Church calls themselves? They call themselves the Mother Church. You go look it up on Google. They call themselves the Mother Church. All them Protestants broke away from us. We the mother of them all. Have mercy. That's what they say, brothers and sisters. This is serious. And you know how serious it is? I have a quotation like a real Maria tomorrow night where they said that this, they said this just last month. A Catholic priest got up and said that there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. You are commanded. Now, brothers and sisters, salvation is not in a church. It's definitely not in old Pope. Salvation is in a man in Christ Jesus. Amen. What he's saying is, unless you're Roman Catholic, you can't be saved. And that is true Catholic teaching. Oh, wait till tomorrow night. I'm wait, I can't wait to get to tomorrow night. And what's happening is what you're going to see, you're going to see all these denominations, all these religious figures uniting with the Pope, brothers and sisters. 
And they have a movement called the ecumenical movement, which is a movement that unite all churches and religions, and they united themselves on this issue of climate change. This is from Huffington Post, 2015-16, and look what the article says. Pope Francis wants to be the president of the world. Did you see that, brothers and sisters? The Bible said the woman will rule the world. Am I right, somebody? So when I read this article, I knew right there, this is a fulfillment of prophecy, that verse. Pope Francis wants to rule the world. It's not a real job, but he is seeking to lead the global conversation. It says here that if you the first sentence says, let me move out of the way. And the first sentence here, it says, he is running to be the president of the planet. There it is, right? All you got to do is read what God says and look on the internet at the right sources and God will confirm over and over and over again. Brothers and sisters, the Tower of Babel is spiritually being built and the Pope wants to finish when Nimrod started. Have mercy. Look what it says here. And they use this issue of climate change. And notice what it says. It says we should follow the Pope's lead on the environment. Have mercy. And he wrote a thing called, he wrote some letter, and it says that everybody should do it and follow him. Look at this right here. Pope Francis issued a blueprint for global but somebody. Hey, he's a, hey, he's a preacher, but watch this right here. He's also a president because Vatican City is the smallest country in the world. And they have a voice in me. They, they have a place in the United Nations. They just joined it recently. You know why? The revelation about being fulfilled. Revelation is about to be fulfilled. And but look what the but look, look what the Pope said about people like myself. Do not listen to prophets of Bill. It says, don't listen to prophets of Bill. He says, quote, the Pope Francis on Sunday called for faithful not to be driven by end time curiosities or apocalyptic preachers. Other words, people who preach on last day events, don't listen to him. You know why? Because they're going to expose him for who he is. Do you understand this right here? Hmm? If I tell you, don't listen to that person right there, but there's no good reason for me to tell you, that means there's something that that person knows that I don't want you to know. Am I right? The Pope said, don't listen to prophets of doom. And brothers and sisters, oh, it's a battle for your mind. You hear me? And I'm here to let you know, brothers and sisters, tomorrow night, we're going to talk about the market. And tomorrow night, we're going to begin our talk on the market. I will just show you Biblically, what it means to receive the mark of the beast and the forehead or anything. I will show you biblically tomorrow night. I will show you what that means. We're going to show you who it is. This one world leader. And if you follow, because the Pope's going to have a part to play in this. You understand this right here? Because she's Babylon. But if you follow this end time agenda, on the, get on the wrong side or stay on the wrong side, these plagues are going to fall upon you. And you're going to burn in hell, brothers and sisters. Oh, yes, the Bible says that. The Bible says it's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. There are going to be people saying, I heard the truth and I decided to stay in Babylon. But what does the Bible say? Come out. Did he say, Come out? Did he say, Come out? Yeah. If you saw a tornado coming to your house, it's time to get out. Or to hide. I'm going to write somebody. And it won't matter if your house is destroyed as long as your life is destroyed. Am I going to write somebody? Am I right? When I hit that deer last week, and I hit that deer, I hit that deer so hard. I hit that thing so hard. I knew it had to die. But when I came back, it was gone. So maybe it survived. But I didn't worry about the fact, oh, my car, my not 2016, whatever it is, uh, car. I just, you know what I did? We called Geico. We did an estimate, and my man's going to fix my car. He was there today. I thank God my life was spared. Amen. So, what we have to do is this right here is this. It don't matter what the tomato's name is. Do you understand this? We know that we got to take shelter. Do you understand this? And we're going to have to take shelter in a thing called truth in these last days. Because the bottom line is, the only thing I want is the truth. You understand this? Because on Judgment Day, there are going to be billions of people that had an opportunity to come into the truth.
and decided to stay in that world. And God is going to show them the books. Look, we, we gave you the truth, but you decided to do your own thing. And they were cast to the lake of fire. But God will have a people, amen, that's going to stand faithful and firm and true to him. And brothers and sisters, it's all about Jesus, amen. We know time is running out. And we're going to talk about something. We're going to talk about the purpose of prophecy tomorrow night when we talk about this. Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about how all this stuff is getting ready. We're going to talk about the forehead and in the hand. We're going to talk about the second beast power of Revelation chapter 13 tomorrow night. And what does the Bible say? Behold, I come as a what, somebody? It's going to be as a thief in the night. It's going to come at a time that people are least expecting it. The Bible says, blessed is he that does what? Watch it. That watch the signs of the times and know what the Bible says and keep the God of salvation. Amen. Let's see what naked and see the shame, brothers and sisters. It's all about salvation. It's all about Jesus, brothers and sisters. Because let me tell you what we're going to find out from tomorrow night and Saturday night. That this beast, this dragon, this false prophet gonna leave many people in hell. And brothers and sisters, I want you to bring somebody. We got some uh, pamphlets out there. Get it, give it to somebody. Amen. So look, you gotta come. Just come. Well, I got a, I got a, I got a party to go to tomorrow night. Come. Amen. I got something to do. Come. I don't feel like coming. Come. I done heard it all. I already know what it is. Come. Amen. Because, brothers and sisters, Satan is going to unleash his last day of deception to where, if it was possible, the very elect would be deceived. Do you understand this? It's all about Jesus, brothers and sisters. Amen. Woo! Man, did you enjoy the study tonight, brothers and sisters? I told you it's going to be hot, but guess what? You better bring some air conditioning to my noise. Pull it down, but you better bring some air conditioning because it's going to be hot in the kitchen tonight. You better get your oven mittens ready, baby, because it's going to get hot in the kitchen. Tomorrow night, you can tell you, I like it hot and sticky. Amen. We're going to talk about who the beast, we're going to talk about Mark and the Beast part one and Saturday night. I promise you, we're going to show you exactly what the Mark and the Beast come on time. Even if something happens, I don't care if you came at 8 15, better late than nothing. Amen. Come on time. All right, let me ask you three questions and then let you go. You can put your prayer request in the back if you have a prayer request. The name Babylon means confusion as well as the gate of God. Is that true or false? Come on now. The name Babylon means confusion as well as the gate of God. True or false? True. All right, the two colors of Babylon are what somebody? Purple and who? Scarlet. Number three, God's people will come out of Babylon. True or false? Number question number four: Who is Babylon? What is the name of that church? The Roman Catholic Church. And my last question is: By the grace of God, I am not going to receive the mark of the beast. If that is your desire, stand to your feet right now. Oh, tomorrow. Oh, I wish we had. Well, I want to tell you right now. And if you gave me th another 30 minutes, I will tell you right now, but no, nah, I'm not going to do it. We're going to give somebody a chance who may have missed out on tonight to hear tomorrow night. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, in heaven, we come before you in prayer. I ask you, Lord, tomorrow night and Friday night are two of the most, tomorrow night and Saturday night are two of the most important Sundays, the most life changing Sundays that ever will be given in this meeting. So, Father, in heaven, bless us, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. Bless us with your power. And I have a feeling, Lord God, that people are going to accept it, Lord. And we thank you. Can you bring back a packed house tomorrow night? Because people need to hear it. It's the weekend. I don't know people have to go to work or out of town. But Father God, bless us with your spirit. May we keep these things which are here to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night. Does anybody need special prayer for healing or for a miracle? You can meet me in the month. God bless you. Bless you.